God, you are our God, and we pray for the grace today to have hearts that would earnestly seek after you. We ask for the gift of having souls that thirst for you. We have looked upon you in the sanctuary, and we ask that you would open our eyes so that we would behold your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. Our lips will praise you. So we will bless you as long as we live. And in your name, lift up holy hands. Satisfy us today with your unfailing love that we would sing for joy and be glad for all our days. Father, we pray for your grace to cover over us right now with your Spirit's presence and power softening hearts to encounter the living God so that we would gladly surrender before you for we belong to you. God, I ask that you'd fill me with your spirit, anoint me, empower me, and preach through me today so that all that is spoken, all that is heard, all that is meditated upon would bring glory to the name of Jesus. In his name alone. So let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sights. O Lord, our rock, our redeemer. And it is in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, many years ago, I came to guest speak for OEM long before uh, I even realized I would be a part of OEM uh, in this capacity. And it was when OEM used to worship on the fifth floor of the building next door in Kyeongchan Hall. And while I was there, it was very memorable for a number of reasons. In particular, uh, I was really struck by the prayer team that was interceding for me during the sermon. Now, I've often had, uh, you know, worship settings where people would be in prayer and prayer teams would be in prayer for me. So that wasn't the peculiar part. Uh, it was very clear that members of the prayer team were praying for me. And how did I know this? Uh, Because uh, a couple of things stood out to me during that service. Number one, they had quite a number of guys on the prayer ministry team. And unfortunately, that is rare. Uh, And I hope it will not be rare uh, much longer. Uh, But they had a lot of guys on the prayer team, and that was a blessing to see. But the other thing that really stood out was those guys on the prayer team, they were all spread around, uh, spread out at the back of the sanctuary wall, lifting up their hands in prayer for me during the sermon time. Uh, And can I tell you, it was probably one of the most encouraging things that I've ever seen uh, while I was preaching. You know, normally you'll see people falling asleep. Uh, But these guys were engaged in intensive intercessory prayer for me. Uh, And, you know, as they were hands lifted and praying earnestly for me, uh, I was so encouraged it made me want to preach as long as possible. Uh, But I also realized that would probably make them start praying that I'd end soon or something. And it was such an encouraging moment within my life to see that. It was a visual reminder of the continual prayers that were lifted up on a constant basis. And obviously, that brings up memories for us of when Moses also was interceding for Joshua and the Israelite army when they were doing battle in Exodus chapter 17 against the Amalekites. How Moses' hands were lifted up, and when his arms were lifted up, the Israelites would be winning the battle. But obviously, his arms got tired. And so when he would lower his arms, uh, then the Amalekites would start to win. And so the people who were next to him realizing this 
Aaron and her, they each took one arm each and they would lift it up to help support Moses as he prayed for victory. And so as his arms were lifted, ultimately they won the battle. That was a powerful picture of intercessory prayer for the people of God and especially for spiritual leaders. You know, we start a new series today and with a couple of guest speakers interspersed within the next couple of months. Uh, but this ne- new series that we're starting from today is on how to pray for your pastor. Now, it's something that I planned on doing later on in this year, the latter portion of this year. But as I mentioned a few weeks ago, in light of the intensity of the spiritual warfare that has increased uh, for most of this year for my life, uh, for various reasons, uh, one with the release of my book, Justice Awakening, uh, which will equip the church to be engaged in one of the fiercest spiritual battles of any generation. I knew that that would instigate more warfare, uh, but also for a lot of other reasons, there has been an increase in resistance and friction in the direction that I feel God wants to lead our ministry. And so out of necessity, and even, dare I say, out of desperation, I felt the need to move up the series uh, as soon as possible. Uh, Why? Because in short, I need your prayers, and our leadership is in need of your prayers. And so we'll begin today by going over why pastors need intercessory prayers. And for the next several weeks, next couple of months or so, Lord willing, Uh, I'll be giving you very practical ways that you could be in prayer for me and the pastors in your life. And uh, it was a great reminder. After the morning service, there were a number of people who came up to me saying, Eddie, it was a great reminder uh, for us to know that you need prayers. And I was like, well, thank you. Uh, And they were saying because usually the mindset that I had some people said in the morning service was, I need to go to you, pastor, to receive prayer, and I forget sometimes that you also need prayer. And so hopefully after today and after this series, that mentality will change. So open your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, uh, and we'll explore today why pastors need intercessory prayer. So you could follow along with me in your outline that I provided for you as well. So why Do pastors need your prayers, and why should we pray for them? Well, first of all, because God calls the church to pray for her leaders. So I've already repeated, pray for her leaders. All right, so that's where we need to begin. Why do we pray for our spiritual leaders? Because God calls us to pray for the leadership. So the church has a vital role to play in the strengthening and the supporting of its pastors through prayer. Paul understood the importance of this intercessory relationship, and so he would frequently ask the churches that he is writing to throughout the New Testament for prayers from them. One example is found in Romans chapter 15, verse 30, as he is writing to the churches in Rome and how they can partner with him in his ministry in this capacity. Romans chapter 15, verse 30 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. And so Paul is asking uh, for prayers from the church in Rome to pray for a successful journey for his ministry in Jerusalem. So let's unpack this verse a little bit. There contains actually a lot in this short verse, in a lot of crucial theology for us to understand. So he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, so I urgently request that you listen to what I have to say right now. So I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ. So the basis of our prayers are to be grounded in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. You see, we have access to the Father in heaven in the place of prayer because of what Jesus did on the cross. He made a way for us to have access and to have adoption into the arms of our Father in heaven. 
You see, what distinguishes Christian praying from all other types of praying that is not uh, grounded on Christian belief is that we are not trusting in the work of prayer to gain the ear of our God or the acceptance of our God. We are not trusting in the work of our prayer. We are trusting in the work of Christ to be the means through which we gain access to the Father and also answers from the Father. And that is why we pray in Jesus' name. It is through Him our prayers are heard, and it is by His grace our prayers are answered. And so that's an important foundational point that we need to understand, that we are able to pray and gain intimate access with the Father only because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Amen? And then he says this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. So another reason we pray is out of love that comes from the Spirit of God that lives within his people uh, and also because of love as being the motive of prayer, right? So love as the motive of all things. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, Jesus tells us, by the way that we love one another. And one of the best ways to love each other is by praying for each other. One of the best ways to love your pastor is by praying for your pastor. So true Christian prayer is grounded in the work of Christ, motivated by love that comes through the Spirit, and then Paul asks for prayer. Verse 30 again, I appeal to you, brothers, by the, our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. This is the basis of his requests, okay? He is the foundation of why he's asking for prayer. Through Christ, by the love of the Spirit, then he says this, Strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. So it's important that this striving is an overflow of faith in Christ and out of love in the Spirit. You see, this term, to strive together, carries the idea with it of wrestling, just like when Jacob wrestled God in Bethel in Genesis chapter 32. Because sometimes prayer is a place to rest, but other times prayer is a place to wrestle. You see, Paul is saying this, wrestle with me and wrestle for me in the place of prayer. He's saying fight with me and fight for me in the spiritual warfare that we are in. Fight for the greater blessings fight for the breakthroughs. You see, that is intercessory prayer. It is a fight for the people we are praying for because it is warfare that we are in. And because they are in warfare, they need our strengthening, our support in the place of prayer, in the place of intercessory prayer, and that is where we also join them in the battle by fighting on our knees for them. That is intercessory prayer. We are fighting for them. We are wrestling for them because we are all in war. Do you realize that God calls the church to not just pray for pastors, but to fight for them in the place of prayer? Paul also reminds Timothy that we must pray for our leadership. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, First of all, then, I urge, again, urgency here, as he speaks of prayer. I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, verse 2, for kings and all who are in high positions, for the leaders in our lives, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So he urges Timothy to lift up supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving for all, especially for our leaders. Pray for their leadership, why? Because how you bless your leaders in prayer will be directly connected to how you are blessed through them, through their leadership. There is a direct correlation between how we bless leaders in prayer and how God will bless you through their leadership. So that, he, that is why he says, I urge you, pray for them. In fact, it's not only a command 
to pray for each other and for our leaders. It's also a sin not to pray for them, the sin of omission. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. So this is the prophet Samuel speaking to the servants of Israel, reminding them that he will always be in prayer for them because to not pray for them would be sinning against the Lord. So it is clear that prayer is a high priority to God, and especially praying for our pastors and spiritual leaders is utterly important to God. God calls the church to pray for her leaders. Amen? Now we want to look further into the reasons why we need to be in prayer for them. For one thing, uh, we need to pray for our pastors because pastors will face greater accountability. So everyone repeat, accountability. Why do pastors need your intercessory prayers? Because we will face a stricter judgment because we are held to a higher standard. James chapter 3 verse 1 not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, teachers that James is referring to here uh, are the equivalent to the rabbis in the Jewish communities, uh, and they are the spiritual leaders, the teachers, and for today, the equivalent would be the pastors. And he's saying, think twice about this role, pastors, and pastor wannabes, think carefully about it, because there will be a stricter judgment that comes with this position. Because our ministry involves so much speech and talking, uh, James reminds us of how hard it is to tame the tongue, how hard it is to not sin by our speech, how with one look we will bless people and then we'll turn around and then curse and gossip about the same people. Right? So there is a very slippery slide that we will go down in terms of being able to sin greatly with our speech. He's saying it's hard to control our tongue. It's hard to use it well for the glory of God, and there is great danger in judgment as a result. You see, with greater visibility, there is greater responsibility because there is greater influence. Luke chapter 12, verse 48 teaches us, Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So because pastors are entrusted with greater responsibility of teaching and influence, more will be required from them. Luke chapter 17 also says, and he says to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. So he's saying sin will happen. Temptations will happen. But Jesus says woe to the person who influences others to sin. So he's saying sin is bad, yeah. Temptation is bad, yeah, but if you are the source of temptation, if you are the one influencing others to sin, there is going to be a far greater judgment to face. And so especially teachers, especially pastors and preachers, whose role is to influence and educate through teaching, he's saying make sure that your influence is for the glory of God and the good of of others. That is why a commitment to teaching Scripture faithfully is so important. That is why the core of the gospel message must never be compromised. That is why we must be committed to truth and the truth of the gospel at all times. So we must call sin for what it is, even if it is unpopular. But we must also declare the grace of Jesus that came for sinners by his love, in grace and truth, to declare the gospel. You see, greater responsibility requires greater accountability. As this nation continues to grieve over the loss of hundreds of lives from the ferry boat accident a couple of weeks ago, 
The police and the investigators have been doing a systematic checklist of who was responsible. Arrests continue to grow. The captain, the crew, the owners of the ship, the owners of the company who ran the ship, one by one, those with the greatest responsibilities are held to the greatest accountability. And the pastor is the captain of the ship for the church. And in the end, when we all stand before God, it is the pastor who must give an account for the ministry. So when we all stand before judgments for the years that we are in OEM, I will be held accountable for the years that I have been pastor here. And that is why I need your prayers, and that is why I need your supports. And that is why Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. It is hard to lead. It is lonely to lead. So it is important to support those who lead. Amen? So that's one crucial reason why pastors need intercessory prayers. And another reason why we need to pray for our pastors is because pastors will face greater attacks. So everyone repeat, attacks. Right? Pastors will face a lot more warfare. And I can testify to that. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So Peter says, be sober-minded, be clear in your thinking, be watchful, do not be dull. Do not be ignorant about the facts that we are in spiritual warfare. Do not think it is vacation time when we are in the middle of war. This is be sober-minded, be clear in your thinking, understand that we are in warfare. That there is an enemy, the devil, who is looking to devour and destroy the people of God, especially through the spiritual leadership. Peter Wagner says in his book, Prayer Shield, make no mistake about it, the higher up you go on the ladder of Christian leadership, the higher you go on Satan's hit list. Satan is more specific, persistent, and intentional when it comes to pastors and other leaders. Consider these figures compiled by the Schaefer Institute several years ago. Uh, these were uh, surveys that were done to several thousands of different pastors within the United States. Now, keep in that mind, this is just the U.S. 90% of pastors reported in the survey of working between 55 and 75 hours per week. Now, this is the U.S. If this survey was done in Korea, 55 to 70 hours per week, that's part-time hours. Okay? 90 percent feel that they are inadequately trained to cope with the ministry demands. They felt that seminary did not train them properly for the real-life ministry battles that they are encountering. On their health and well-being, 70 percent of pastors constantly fight depression. 67 percent of pastors are extremely overweight, above the overweight standards even of the regular population in the United States. 50% of pastors feel so discouraged that they would leave the ministry if they had another job lined up right away. On, cons uh, on marriages and family, 80% believe pastoral ministry has negatively affected their families. 80% of spouses feel the pastor is overworked. 80% of spouses feel left out and underappreciated by church members. On church relationships, 40% report serious conflict with a parishioner at least once a month. 
and the number one reason why pastors leave the ministry, church people are not willing to go, are not willing to go in the same direction and support the leadership of the pastor. So the pastors believe God wants them to go in a certain direction, uh, begin certain ministries, and the support, participation, and encouragement by the church body is not there. That is the number one reason why pastors leave. And on longevity, 50% of ministers who start out in ministry will not be in ministry five years later. Only one out of every 10 ministers will retire as a minister, just 10%. And get this, over 1,700 pastors leave the ministry every month due to burnout, moral failure, discouragements, depression. 1,700, and this is just in the United States. Over 1,300 pastors were fired by their local church each month, most without cause. So chances are the pastors that you know in your life are tired, beaten up, and discouraged. The late Peter Drucker, one of the leading uh, management authors of the business world of our generation, he once said that he believes church leadership to be the most difficult and taxing roles in existence. He said bluntly, the business world is much easier than the church world when it comes to leadership. One reason out of many, he believes, is because in business, you can go home and leave your work behind. But when you are a minister, you are on call 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. When you run into anyone <laughs> that knows you're a pastor, it is time to give and pray and counsel and encourage, no matter what time of day it is. And especially late at night, when crises happen, the minister is usually the first that they will call. And so that leads to extremely high stress levels. The pastoral position is one of the highest professions for heart attacks. They are pulled in so many directions. They are expected to be an expert in almost every field of study. They are, they are expected to have memorized the Bible and be able to know what the Bible says about any topic that ever comes up. And they are expected to be able to create a sermon on demand. You just press their belly button and somehow a sermon will regurgitate. And also they experience what is called secondary stress disorder. Meaning because of the intensities of the counseling situations that they go through, uh, it's usually intense you know, situations of uh, marriages breaking down, suicidal thoughts, or runaway children, and all these intense stressful counseling situations that they go through, uh, the surveys also discovered that pastors are one of the loneliest people in the world because their church people do not see them as humans. Uh, they have to be supermen, superwomen, uh, be able to handle anything, any problem, and solve it. <laughs> no sleep. It's okay, right? You're a pastor. You don't sin. You don't need to rest. You don't need to sleep. You don't need anything, right? You don't need money. You're a man of God, right? So all of these crazy expectations, uh, they don't have anyone to share with, usually, and so they experience what med uh, the medical term is called the secondary stress disorders because they experience stress through all the other people that they're ministering to. And so realizing the high expectations that they have from other people, and also realizing that they do not meet those expectations at all, they experience discouragement, depression, and uh, heartache. So all in all, uh, there is an all-out attack against the pastor in this generation like never before. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, uh, Jesus is speaking to Simon, Peeper, Simon Peter, and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. This is a very encouraging verse, I think, for pastors. 
Jesus is revealing, Simon Peter, Satan has asked for permission to destroy you, to attack you, to rip you apart, to sift you as wheat. And actually, what also Jesus is revealing is Satan has been, been given permission to an extent to attack Peter. But then Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, Peter, that when you turn back, meaning you are going to fail, you are not perfect, you're going to lose some battles. When you turn back to me, strengthen the brothers. So pray for your pastors. Pray that our faith will not fail even when we do fail. Amen? But it's been kind of serious till now. On an encouraging note, another reason why pastors need intercessory prayers is because pastors will become more effective with prayer. So everyone repeat, effective. All right, so pastors will become more effective with prayer. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Can we read these verses together? Ready, begin. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. So Paul asks for prayer so that his ministry will become more effective. So he says, pray for us so that the word of the Lord, our teaching ministry, our t preaching ministry, our evangelism ministry, as we share the word of the Lord, pray for us so that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly, quickly, and be received with joy and honored amongst those who hear the word, just as the word was honored in your hearts when you first heard the word of the Lord. Okay. So he's praying He's asking for prayers, saying, pray for us, because he knows prayer impacts the effectiveness of ministries. There is a direct correlation between praying for your minister and the effectiveness of the ministry. Ministries and ministers that are covered in prayer are more effective for the fruitfulness of the kingdom of God because prayer releases and brings forth the presence of God in a special way. Prayer releases the power of God in a special way. Prayer releases the purposes of God in his kingdom in a special way. Whereas if prayer was not there, the effectiveness would not be as much. And so for the church, you need to understand that this is a win-win situation. When pastors are well prayed for, the leadership is more effective and ministry is more fruitful and you get blessed because anointing flows from the top down. There was a fascinating study done on intercessory prayer for the pastor several years ago. Uh, and this was the study... Intercessors trained through the Everna Tompkins Ministries of Scottsdale, Arizona, in the U.S., agreed to pray 15 minutes a day for one of the 130 pastors and spiritual leaders within their community over an entire year. And part of the study also had some people praying every day, some people praying weekly, some people praying monthly for these pastors and spiritual leaders. And they did a survey, uh, they did the experiment, and they did the survey for the, <clears throat> the pastors prayed for before and after uh, this year experiment. These were the results. About 89%, almost 90% of those surveyed indicated that the prayers had caused a positive change within their life and their ministry. They reported more effectiveness in their use of spiritual gifts a higher level of positive response in their ministries as they were teaching and preaching and cr uh, creating new ministries, the response of the people were far more fruitful than in years past. 
They saw an increase in discernment and wisdom from God, increased wholeness, completeness, and security in Christ, improved attitudes and more evidence of the fruit of the Spirit, better personal prayer lives, and heightened leadership skills. And the research uncovered one crucial variable. They found that daily prayer for leaders were more effective than weekly or monthly prayers for their spiritual leaders. So what became evident through this experiment is that prayers make a difference in the lives of pastors and churches. Pastors become more effective with a covering of prayer by the church. Your prayers, daily prayers, will only have a positive effect on me, our staff, our church, our ministry, because prayers are powerful. Prayers make a difference, and prayers will bless through you, and those blessings will come back to you. I'd love to try that experiment here at OEM, and I'd love to ask you to pray for me and our staff every day for the next couple of months through this series. Or better yet, can I ask you to pray for us every day for the rest of this year? And let's see what happens in terms of the fruitfulness of our ministry and the blessings within your own life as well. You see, God's Word clearly calls the church to be in prayer for pastors. With this high calling comes great responsibility, great accountability. But the enemy is out in full force to destroy and remove pastors from their place of leadership. Because when you strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. If you could remove the leader from its place, it'll be a lot easier to attack the flock. But with prayers will also come greater effectiveness and blessings. So my desire through this series is for us to grow to be a people of prayer, grow to be a house of prayer. Because for our pastoral staff, we need your prayers. Because for a pastor, the congregation's prayer supports is the pastor's life supports. You see, your prayer support is my life supports. And we need to grow to be a people, a place, a house of prayer. Amen.